Thank you much. Mine is over in Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 13 and 14. It says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. That's what he's looking for. He wants to see those new creatures regular standing out there saying, I'm not what I used to be by the grace of God. I'm a new creature. Amen. And we're proud to have you on Wednesday night. It's an effort for anybody to go to church because the flesh don't want to go. That's going to be every trip. And so the flesh has got to do something. It's got to go to Calvary. And Calvary is the death chamber. For the flesh, and there is where there is life. The life of Christ comes on. Both, both sides cannot control you. And that's what happened to Zeph. The flesh is saying, no. But that spiritual man says, you know what? Okay. Look what Jesus has done for me. I'm going to bring honor to God. Go. So help me, God, I'm going to bring honor to him. Woo! And so you go on from there. Amen. Yes. Amen. So we're proud to have you, every one of you. I want us to, we're just going to kick back a little bit because we're just about to finish this particular study on, uh, on the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 12. The writer started out with five things he wanted to bring out. We've looked at three and a half of them. We've done everything on number four except the scriptures, and I want just to check in with you again on those. We'll read the scriptures and put the the comment of the writer with it just to bring you up to speed. Verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter 12 says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And so here he says because others, there's so many others in chapter 11 of Hebrews that run the race and done good running it. I remember Brother Ross telling me that they, before they let him back in, in as a chaplain, that he had to go through some uh, rigu rigorous training. And they was trying to get him to run the 100 yard dash or 50 yard dash or something. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't the only one who was struggling, but when you get our age, running is not, is not a real good option, is it, brother? <laughs> but the race that we're running is, like Zeph said, it's, it's not a physical race. It's a spiritual race. And every day, how we run our day out proves if we're, run, if we're winning the race or if we're losing it. And so there, we've got, we want to be real good at checking what's going on and, and seeing where we're at in the Lord. So the first, the first thought the writer brings out of this, out of this verse one is inspiration. Would you say it with me? Inspiration. inspiration. Now, if you don't have inspiration, you don't vacuum the carpet. You don't carry out the trash. Come on now. You don't worry about what you look like. You can be slouchy as a hog and you don't care. If you have no inspiration, inspiration does so much stuff for us, even in the physical realm. And then to bring that over into the spiritual realm. Wow. When you bring it into the spiritual realm and your want to for Christ is so inspired because you've seen others do it and make it and go through all kinds of storms. I mean, since I started reading the Bible, when I get down to chapter 11, where they're cutting those people in two with a saw. And that wasn't one of these, meow, you know, that would cut you real quick. It was a cross cut. They put you inside a hollow tree and, uh, and then they cut the tree in two while you're in there. With a cross cut saw and the teeth on them things are huge. Horrible. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't turn Jesus away even though they was cutting them in two with a saw. That's pretty strong words. And so when you look at that and, and you look at how much uh, drive they had and integrity and inspiration, they were so inspired to serve Jesus that all the riches of Egypt did not cross Moses' mind. You know what he said? I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That put him out of the kingship. But he said, I don't care. I'm a Hebrew and my mama is Jochebed. <laughs> 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 Woo! 
<laughs> and they hated him for it and the world hated him for it. But look, look what God done with that man because he turned down such riches and wealth and society to bring honor to God. So inspiration is so, it's so incredible to to be inspired, to be driven uh, with the winds of the anointing of God. So that was the first verse, inspiration. On down in that same verse, he talks about because so many people have made it and this is how they made it. They made it by doing something. And what did they do? They laid aside and so he says, if we're going to be like them, we've got to do something. What are we going to do, church? Let us, let's be like them, lay aside every what? Wait. Every weight. Something that's kind of getting us off a of kilter. And the sin that does so easily beset us. He didn't say that we're hard to get down. He said it's easy. If we allow a drip to come into our system, it's not long until our spiritual oil is milky and fouled up and it's not working right. So he says, we've got so many people that's made it and they did something. They laid aside the weights and the sins where they could be honorable to God. And he said, let us. So that's the second thing. It requires discipline. We talked about inspiration. The Second thing was discipline. What is life without discipline? Chaos. It's chaos. Absolutely. I went into the ninth grade in vocational agriculture and I had made me a way through school. I just did as much as I had to to pass. I just didn't like school. I'd never, I don't remember a day I wanted to go to school, ever. We farmed and had horses and I had more to do at the house a jillion times over. We milked a cow before we went to school. Who wants to go to school after you milked a cow? Somebody help me now. <laughs> Man, ride that bus for an hour, an hour and a half home. And, oh! Oh, they're killing me. <laughs> so all my schooling was the same way. It was like I couldn't wait to get up. But in the ninth grade, something happened. Uh, our ag teacher was uh, uh, Floyd Collins, a little short guy, about that tall, and probably he was probably 35 or 40, and single. But this guy was motivated to teach uncouth ninth graders. <laughs> how to win. He said, if, if you go with me, we're going to win. It don't matter if it's chicken judging, grass judging, uh, wh whatever we do, we're going to win. He said, I know how to win and we're going to win. And if we don't win, I'm going to whip you with this paddle. Because <laughs> the only reason we won't win is because you don't do your homework. So we are going to win. He said, you may want to leave right now. The door's open. If you don't like it, get out. I thought, hmm, this is a little different. <laughs> so he gave us about, I don't know, five pages to look at and to duplicate the next day. He said, just by memory. Take these home with you, look them over. You're going you're to get an opportunity to duplicate these tomorrow, tomorrow by memory. <laughs> Well, I, I couldn't put three words off of them five pages down. So he lined us all up and beat the Pharaoh out of us. <laughs> he said, the door's still open. This is the second day. If you don't want to do something in this class, get out because we're going to have winners. You know what? The next day I could write everything on those five pages down by memory and not miss a dot by the one or the two or the three or the eight. Come on now. And what he did, he took the clabber in my mind and turned it back into me. <laughs> he, he started at the bottom and warmed us up till we got to the... I said, we, we can do it. When we, went, when we went, wherever we went, we won everywhere we went. Maybe not first place every time, but we wouldn't be no lower than second. No! Well, that board's about that long. <laughs> and he brought it with him. Yeah. So discipline, if you don't have no discipline, you're never going to do nothing. No. I love when you're shouting. You will. That's right. What did they do? They disciplined themselves. They looked the weight over and they looked the sin over. And they said, no, we're not going there. 
We're not going to dabble in and out and act like we're a fool. We belong to somebody that put his blood on the line. He's not going to spank us or paddle us with a wooden board. But he gave so much, how can we lightly go into this relationship like we don't know nothing? Mm -mm. No. And so the driving force is, God, let us go forward. I'll never forget, we'd come home on the bus, and uh, we weren't supposed to take no alcohol or nothing. And somebody, you, you know how kids are. And so he would get up there at the front of the bus about, about five miles out before he, there would be somebody driving. There'd be a whole load of us kids on there, all boys that was in vocational ag and on those different teams, uh, uh, chicken judging, grass judging, cow judging, whatever there was, we'd done it all. Anyway, uh, he's, he'd go up there and he said, I'm just going to give you one shot at this. And we was afraid that he could read our minds. <laughs> He said, if you done something that you was told not to do and you did it anyway, while we was gone, get up here because I'm going to thrash you as we get off the bus. And you can't believe the people that would fall out. And I was one of them every time. <laughs> so he'd give us four or five good swats getting off the bus. And, said, and that's all he said. He'd never say nothing. He didn't ridicule you or nothing. He said, but the next time you went on the bus with him, <laughs> yeah, he's standing right up there with a paddle. <laughs> Come on. What's he doing? He's educating us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget. Well, that's enough on this one probably, but I'll tell you one more deal. I don't know if you ever seen a mustard seed. You can probably put 10,000 mustard seeds in a little old tray about like that. They're, they're, they're not no uh, bigger than the end of a, of a pen. And he said, he put all these trays out on the table. <laughs> and he's, now we're learning seed judging because <laughs> you know the grass by the seed. <laughs> he said, now, this is the way this goes down. You, you bump one of those or turn them over or spill them, you get a lick for each seed. <laughs> And guess what? The first batch was bumped. Not turned plum over, but it was the mustard seed. <laughs> and he got his knife down there and counted them off and spanked us accordingly. <laughs> ah, the whole class got a few licks for it. <laughs> oh, yeah. He said, oh, he was brutal. Let me tell you what. He woke us up. I was good friends with Floyd. And I understand what you're saying. Yeah, he didn't have no backup. But the same way, he he would fight a, a, a bear for you. I mean, he won't. He was he's going to win or or else. <laughs> and the, the strange thing, I, I don't remember anybody leaving his class. We all loved him when we graduated and went into high school. Then he only had the ninth graders, and Billy Bob McMullen had the had the. 10, 11, and 12. And he used the board pretty good, but nothing like, nothing like Floyd Collins. He was like a drill sergeant. And we needed it. I mean, you take kids, you know, in the ninth grade with, I mean, just as hammer-headed as you can be. Woo! So, yes, is discipline important? Yes. And still, listen, you, you've got to, there's nobody going to whoop you over the head and make you do now. You have got to get a hold of self. And that's what he says. Look what he says here. Don't wait till somebody beats you up from the pulpit. <laughs> Who would that be? It would be you. But look what he says. Let us lay aside. So this becomes a personal deal in our life. If he pitched a deal out there and said, know that tomorrow, he didn't have to tell me twice. I might stay up to one o'clock, but I'm going to learn what's on that page and be able to reproduce it. In fact, I'll have it wrote down four or five times at home before I get to school. Oh, I love it when you're shouting. Can you imagine how our life will change if we do Jesus like that? Lord, I'm going to be good. I'm not going to be a drag or a slouch. I'm going to stand up because I belong to Calvary. And I'm going to, I'm going to do what the Lord has laid in my spirit. Discipline is a must for all of us. And we don't have to be hard on other people. What we've got to be is be hard on ourselves. I love when you shout now. You know, we think about this one. We're going to get somebody else. But what we want to do is get a hold of that person we look at in the mirror all the time. 
That's the one I've got. I've got to get a hold of Danny Williams and say, Lord, touch me. Touch me, God, and let, let me do good for you. As long as I got breath in this body, I want to bring honor to the Lordship of Jesus. So the second thing he talked about was it required discipline. And the discipline was lay aside every, every weight and the sin which is so easy to beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So a patient race is it's long. It's a, it's means it's a, it's a long one. You get tired. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't like to sing the songs. It's some of them it's out there, but I know where they come from. Have you ever heard this one? I'm so tired and I'm so weary, but I must go on till my Jesus comes to call. Call me away. Oh, yeah. That really, that, that really is from the people that walked all time. Can you imagine walking three or four miles or ten to everywhere they went or, or driving a wagon? You know they was really were Plow all day behind it. My, my granddad, when he was 50 years old, had wore out both of his hips. He farmed uh, probably, I don't know, six or seven hundred acres. He had nine boys. But they farmed that six or seven hundred acres with horses and teams. And they, they was little. I mean, the, the kids wasn't big enough to do a grown man's job all the time. But, I mean, in, in one row equipment, can you imagine bedding 700 acres up with one row equipment? That means you go all the way down and you come back to make one row. If it's a mile long, it takes you, it's a two mile trip to go down there and back to make one, one row that's 40 inches wide. Mm. And you gotta go plumb across that field. <laughs> that was that was some tough times, and I can see where those songs came from. It come out of a out of a out of a rough out of a rough way, and people all from from the beginning of time until we got cars and electricity and all that stuff. Everything they did was just it was it was slow, hard, tedious work. I'm not mocking the song because it was real, but in the midst of that was we're going to serve Jesus. Whatever happens, they gather them kids up and, and took off. It didn't matter if it's in a wagon or, or a Model T or walking, whatever. We're going to church. We're going to honor God. And, and these folks in Hebrews 11, uh, all their stuff was, was, you know, horse and buggy. And, and it, that just, that's just, that wasn't no electricity. We don't know. We're rotten. Yes. We are spoiled rotten. We get out and crank our car and let it run 30 minutes before we get in because we don't want to be hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on. <laughs> I love it when you shout. Yeah. I'm talking about, yeah. Hey, where's the discipline? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to kill you. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Now, the next part he talks about is in verse number two. We look at all this great cloud of witness. We have inspiration. We understand discipleship. And then he says, and then looking unto Jesus. Wow. How, how can we look at Christ and then look at our deal and say, I've got it rough? No. No. You remember the song, He Left the Splendors of Heaven? Yeah, He left heaven to come down here in the form of a human and live 33 and a half years. Whoa, man. What, what a great... And so what, what the writer puts here is, this is number three, his supreme example that he would leave everything that made him rich all the glories of heaven to come down here and be with us to lift us up out of sin into righteousness Woo! You, you just can't get enough at looking to Jesus the supreme example over and over every time we get down we say Lord I'm just going to look back to you I know there's a lot of people there's Jesus out there and he is our ultimate example and we must say there's times that we fail so we got to say don't get your eyes on humanity I heard a, a gentleman, in fact, he was a good friend of mine. Uh, there was about five or six of us men, probably just young pastors, that was over the each section. And I was a sectional rep, and he was one of the reps. In fact, he was over the Pecos section at that time uh, in, in Odessa. 
And um, I love this boy. Me and him, we got along good. He, he was a good, good boy. What, what really hurt my heart so bad that uh, whenever Jimmy Swagger failed, and, and I'm sure most of you know that, uh, he come to me, we was, we was down at the youth camp working, and he said, uh, he said, Danny, I mean, we all got off by ourselves, and he said, if that man, if Jimmy Swagger can't make it, nobody can. I said, James, his name is James Gildon. I said, James, don't get your eyes on no human. Please. Whatever that man does is between him and God. Keep your eyes on what? The supreme example. Guess what? He ain't never failed. He's been tempted at every point like we've been tempted. And guess what the book says? Yeah. And yet he is without sin. Look at his mercy, his compassion, his love. When you're talking about the supreme example and he goes to the cross like a lamb. He could have scattered them to the four winds. He could have raised up and ruled the Roman Empire. But he didn't because he wanted to save lost mankind. And he knew that their salvation, to be like him and God and the Holy Ghost wanted, it had to be by free choice. Mm -hmm. That people must serve Jesus because they love him. They love him. Not because it's mandatory. You will never be demanded by Christ or God or the Holy Ghost to serve Jesus. If if you serve him, you serve him because you love him. And, and there's nothing else. I don't care how, how, how high the preacher jumps or how loud he gets down your collar. If you don't love Christ, you won't go to heaven. Because the relationship between us and Christ is looking at that supreme example and recognizing, I love him so much, I don't want to bring no shame to him. I want to bring honor to him. And so there's this continual checking in daily, hourly, momently, Lord, let me, let me make all this stuff, let me make all this stuff great. Because stuff happens all the time. People, people has all kinds of ways to get your goat. And what we better do is tie the goat up and leave him at home. Yeah. You know, it may be at the cash register, like like they got they got Sharonda and and <laughs> Sister Franklin, or it could be a car. You know, you're nearly there, and they just pull out in front of you, and you've got to slam your brakes on. <laughs> Man, that's aggravating, isn't it? <laughs> and what do we got to do? Get, look at our example. What did Jesus say? Lord, forgive them. They don't know or they don't care. Yeah, just let them go. And I, I learned something early on. Don't expect too much of a sinner. Because if you do, you're going to get your feelings hurt. Don't expect them to act like a Christian. Some Christians don't even get that done. Amen. Come on now. You got to pray through, pull back up, and do right. So if you see somebody that's, you know, going off, you know, if they claim to be a Christian, they're going off. The, they done slipped the cog. They're going to have to get their business straightened up. Yeah, just let it go. And we can be like Jesus, Lord, just forgive them. I'm trying to. I'd rather uh, tell them what I think, but I can't do that. <laughs> we don't want to give them a piece of our mind most of the time we don't have enough uh, left over <laughs> operate our own business <laughs> Just let them go why because of the supreme example like a sheep before the shearers came Jesus before the people that accused him everything they said was a lie everything Pilate's wife dreamed and writes a letter to her husband Pilate and says don't you do nothing to this just man. Don't say nothing against him. Don't do nothing to him. This man, this is, this is the son of God. So and Pilate, so much yeah, it's not. he looks that over. But with what happens, the, the Israelis and the, and the Pharisaical and the Sadduceical church, they won't give it up. And so he said, well, let me turn this man loose back to you. I'll scourge him, turn him loose. He said, I, I find no fault in him. And uh, I'll, I'll just keep Barabbas because every year they turn around and say, no, give us Barabbas, but crucify this Christ. And so they took a murderer and a thief and turned him loose and killed an innocent man. Mm. So when you look at that and then Jesus on the cross, what does he say? They're down there gambling on his vesture. Forgive them. 
So our supreme example is Christ. I mean, you could go on with that forever. The fourth thing is it's controlling factor. And it, say, it says here in, in, this, in this passage that we're looking at, in verse number three, consider him that endured such contradiction. And if you live for Jesus very long, this is going to this is going to happen. You just people, it's going to they they're going to let you know that they don't believe that, and they're going to contradict what you say, and they're going to quote all kinds of pieces of scripture that they put it together any way they want to. I had I had a man in the in the jail. His name was Daniel Cortez. He, he had been listening to me speak to the boys in the jail for three or four Sundays. I could see him laying, laying up there on the top bunk with his back to me. He wouldn't come down. One day I was teaching uh, there at the door and he, he bails off his bunk and he comes out there and he shakes my hand and all of his, uh, no, his thumb. I think, I think there was, uh, I know his thumb was cut off, maybe, maybe two or three fingers too. Anyway, he, he said, I stuck them in there and stopped the whole deal just to show the men I, I was a leader. And he had a, he had a signet on his, uh, brother, brother uh, Ross might know about this, he had a signet on his uh, hand right there. And uh, the, the guys that knew the prison language, when they saw that, it was scared to death of him. He run, while he was there, he run the jail from the inside. And... Uh, Anybody that dirted somebody else when they went to get their to work out, you know what? They got a whip. They got whipped. <laughs> I mean, he, he he was his own lawyer. He'd been studying law. He'd been in school in in prison since he was sixteen. He was about thirty five at this time, and he studied the law. He he knew more law than the lawyers knew. He was his own lawyer. He finally he finally got so radical. The judge said, "Get him out of here and send him to Amarillo." <laughs> <laughs> they they couldn't they couldn't get a judgment on him. Anyway, he comes down there and he done the Bible the same way. He come down there and he looked me right in the eye. He said, "I am Daniel Cortez. I am a professional thief. I never steal from my own people or the poor. I steal from the rich because the Bible said." That is harder for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And he said, they're going to hell anyway, so it's not going to matter if I get their money. <laughs> and look, look at his take. That was his take on it. And I, it was several weeks before that boy come to Christ. But what happened? The seed, the seed kept falling over into his life because the Bible gives no breaks to wickedness. None whatsoever. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4 says, let him that stole, steal no more, but get a job. Get a job, go to work, quit being a thug. Come on now. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, get you a job. And then when somebody needs something, instead of you being a thief, you can give them a five on the side. Say, hey, I'll help you get enough gas you can get home. Yeah. So here, here we are. Consider him that endured such contradictions. I mean, they said everything from the beginning of his ministry right on through. Them naysayers had their mouth open all the time. It's a wonder some of them didn't get the dry heat from just gaping all the time. And Jesus dealt with every one of them as kindly and tenderly. Uh, in fact, you know, if you go to like uh, uh, St. John chapter 8, uh, skip down about to the third verse of St. John chapter 8. Th this is the kind of people that Jesus dealt with all time. And what awes me is his love for the ones that was going to stone the little woman to death. I can see him loving the woman and saving her. But if you know anything about Christ, what he said was to touch them too. What does he use to touch people? Conviction. Yeah. So here in verse number three, the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. They had caught her with a man. I always want to ask, where's the man? Because it, it was a death sentence for the man and the woman. They were both crooked. 
They brought the girl. They're going to kill her. They had the rocks with them. And when they had set her in the midst, they, right, they just brought her just like we're having service right here. Of course, I imagine there was hundreds of people there in the temple where Jesus was teaching. They bring her right to the front. They, they want to make mockery of Christ. They're going to do it in front of the whole crowd. That's what the devil does. Look at verse number four. They said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. They got a snarl. You know, Jesus already, he, he's already reaching out to her. You know, I'm, 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 from what I know of Christ, he's, he's, he forgives. He loves us. Now Moses and the law command us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Boy, I mean, they, I mean before everybody. And the Jews knew, knew how to kill people. That was a regular thing. I mean, they was mean. This they said, look at this word. That sounds like the devil, doesn't it? This they said, tempting, tempting him. That they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Don't you love his attitude? <laughs> He just stoops down, just starts writing on the ground. They're up here just going nuts, you know, like, tell us, tell us, tell us. <laughs> it's so precious. So when you consider the trouble, what do you do? One thing, keep your mouth shut. Help me? Instead of eating them up. <laughs> okay, all right, y'all. I thought you was going to shout a little bit here. <laughs> and when they continued asking him, they won't give it up. They're not going to leave. And they got the whole bunch out there said, now, hey, we want to hear what you got to say. You're this big rabbi teacher. Tell us what to do with this woman. He lifted up himself and said unto them, He, oh, you talk about the pistol loaded with ammunition. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Wow. When, when I see that, I see Jesus reaching out to his own people. He, here's Jesus sending his disciples out. And you know what he says? Go not, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know how the house of Israel treated Jesus? You're seeing it right here. This is it. Horrible. If you've never sinned, get your rock out. Verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. <laughs> Don't you? Now, this is why we've got to consider Christ. And this is one of hundreds of times in the Scripture that Jesus reaches out to touch both bunches. He stooped down, rode on the ground, and they which heard it. Now, notice, notice this word right here. This is the Holy Ghost bringing what on their heart? Conviction. Conviction. These men that came in so inerrant, now... They're convicted in their own heart. And what are they convicted of? They are convicted of their own sin. <clears throat> their conscience. went. They went out <coughs> one by one. And notice where they started. <laughs> this wasn't little Junior that leaves. It's the one that led. That led the break. <coughs> Beginning at the eldest. Even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So everybody else's mouth is like ours. Would be. They're falling out. And then Jesus looks back at the woman. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those Thine accusers, hath no man, <laughs> hath no man condemned thee? Boy, you can just see her little old trembling figure. And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. 
And friends, all through the Bible, Jesus dealt with these people over and over. I mean, it would wear you out. I think we looked last week at uh, John, John chapter 7, just back one scripture, where, where his own kinfolk did not believe in him. Look at about verse number, uh, I think it's going to be like 7 and 6, something like that. Okay, uh, back up one more. Maybe it's, maybe it's five. Yeah, that's it right there. They, they're making fun of Jesus' ministry. They've heard what he does. And they said, if this is real, get out there in front of everybody and just put us a show on. That, that's, what, that's basically what they're saying. <clears throat> and here's why. For neither did his brethren believe in him. That hurts. That hurts, but it don't stop. It don't stop love. No. You know where they're coming from. They, they weren't believers. And so that's why I'm saying, don't expect too much of a sinner or your heart's going to be broke. But when conviction comes and they recognize they're wrong and God's right, that, that's, when, that's when we come over on God's side of the road and life has changed. And so to think about that, the, its controlling factor um, it is staying in our mind must be this thought. Verse number three, for consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself. And notice these next words. Let's who? You. Lest you be wearied. And what weariness does, it gets us to where I, this is what happens. I tried and it ain't working. It's not that it's not working. What's happened, you've let it get to you. And so that's why the Lord says, casting all your care on him because he cares for you. Don't, don't let the devil browbeat you till you throw the towel in. Just chunk the stuff that's dragging you down at an altar of prayer over on the shoulders of Jesus. What does he say? What is it, Matthew? Uh, is, it, uh, is it 11? Yes. Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. Look at this passage. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And what? How do you feel after you've got a good rest? Eddie, is it better after you get over the sickness you caught up there at Lubbock? <laughs> Man, that was some mean stuff, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. You walk away from it and say, whoo, I feel, I feel good now. Come with me. I'm going to give you a rest. Look at verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am making lowly and hard. And what's going to happen? Ye shall find rest for your souls. 30. My yoke is easy. And my burden is light. So should we go around browbeat all time and down in the mouth? No. We cast that stuff off, Lord. I can't handle this. This is God's business. And we go on in the glory of God. And I think uh, verse number 31 is the last verse in that chapter, I'm not mistaken. Or that may be it. Is that the last one there? Okay, that's it right there. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Woo! So should, man, we ought to. You know that song, shake off those heavy bands, lift up those holy hands. Yeah, let all of God's people praise the Lord. If you're praising God, you can't be down in the mouth because there's a joy in your heart. And that's why Nehemiah told the people when they were wearing out, he said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. <laughs> you got to stay happy about this or you're going to give it up. So don't let the devil get you down. So this here, consider him that endured such contradictions. And the latter part of that verse says, lest you be wearied. And notice these next last, last four words. And faint where? In your mind. That's the latter part of verse number three. And I, uh, th that was the fourth, the fourth thought was its controlling factor. Because your mind, what you think in your mind, the Bible says a man thinketh in his heart. So is he. If you think you ain't going to make it, guess what? That's the way you're going to end up. So we, we got to think beyond just normal. We, we think by faith. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> We think by faith. We say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but by faith we're going to do it. We're believing God for it. And then you take your step of faith, and guess what? The Lord meets us right there at that time. Wow. So precious. So we looked at 19 things last week that Jesus endured just as a child, as a person. Do you remember even one of those 19 things? Uh, 
Okay. Okay, I'll just. When he was stayed, when he was twelve, and stayed with those <coughs> those people, the preachers. Yes. It, okay. And his mom and dad come back and got him. It's like. Son, what are you doing here? Okay, that's good. Uh, the, the writer just pulled out several things in the scripture that he was born of an unwed mother. And so they made fun of Christ because of that. He was born where? In a stable. How many of y'all was born in the barn? And wrapped in rags and put in the horse trough or a cow trough? No. No, we had it better than that, but not Christ. His parents were poor, so poor they couldn't offer the normal sacrifice, which was a lamb for, to cleanse Mary. They, they had to take two turtle doves. Threatened as a baby, Herod said, I'm going to kill him. He does kill uh, all the kids in Bethlehem and in the surrounding area. Uh, unimaginable sorrow caused by him because of his birth, because all those kids, uh, the, it talks about in the scripture, Rachel uh, crying for her children. Uh, he was shifted back and forth as a child. They ran him from uh, Jerusalem or Bethlehem to another country. In Egypt, he had stayed in Egypt until Herod died, and then they, they were still afraid to go back down there to Bethlehem, even though uh, that was the, the natural place, or that's where uh, his dad was raised at, was there at Bethlehem. They go back to Nazareth, and you remember, you remember the scripture, what the Pharisees and scribes always said, uh, he, they, they knew he'd come from Nazareth, and what did they say? Can any good thing come out of it? Can any good thing? Was it Nathaniel also that said that? One of the disciples? Yeah, that was going to become... When he first came up. Yeah. When he first came up, he said... When Andrew was, was telling him, he said... Any, any, any good thing come can any good thing come from Nazareth? Because Nazareth was like a bad place. Okay. Uh, his father, evidently, from what the scripture says, because he was never noted later on, uh, passed when he was either in his youth or a young man. Uh, he had no support from his brothers and sisters. That, that would hurt your heart. Uh, the scripture says he had no place to lay his head. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but I have not a place to lay my head. He was opposed by the religious uh, the religious. Uh, hierarchy of his day he was charged with insanity <laughs> i'm sure some of us say that some say that about us he's crazy <laughs> yeah but let me alone i'm having the time of my life <laughs> insanity this is in mark 321 he was he was charged with demon possession that's what he said said he's he's of beelzebub <laughs> that's mark uh Chapter 3, verse 22, uh, rejected, hated, opposed by the audiences, uh, carried out one time to the brink of the hill there at Nazareth that's going to shove him off the cliff, uh, betrayed by a close friend. Is it, that's a lot of stuff to happen. Who was that? Who was the close friend that betrayed him? Judas, yes, of course. Uh, alone, rejected, forsaken by all of his friends, the disciples, the Bible says, when they picked Jesus up and carried him to, the, to take him to Calvary, that his disciples, they fled. Uh, tried by the high court for treason and then executed by crucifixion, the worst possible death. And still he comes out of there and says, I love the whole world. Woo! And I'll save the dregs in the bottom of the cup, even the ones that's gambling on my vesture. Whoa, that's some strong words. And so here's the scriptures that goes with number four. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Wow, what a rejoicing. And what a poke for us or a prod. Look at Matthew 11 and verse number 29. We looked at the scripture just a while ago, but it's so precious. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. All of this is, all, is saying when, you get, when you're getting down, consider him lest you be wearied. 
in Galatians 5 and 7. Galatia was like a state like Texas or South Dakota or whatever and in that area was a bunch of church and the book of Galatians was written to these churches and their struggle was going back to the law of Moses and Paul is writing this and telling them you started off good you did run well who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. So we don't want to go back where we come from. We want to stay right with God. Galatians 6 and 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So it's good for us to come together, look things over, and see where we take our stand according to biblical truth. And then from there, we walk on with the Lord as we consider Christ, what's going on in, in that area. In Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start reading in verse number 10, 10, 11, and 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Can you imagine the voice that spoke to that mama just a few days ago and said, cut your child's throat and to take a knife and kill a three-year-old baby that was born, that you, that you carried and raised. This is rulers of darkness. This is demonic. No mama in her right mind could ever do that. I want you to know that. That is not normal. If it happens every day a million times, that's the devil's way. It'll never be right. Never. We're fighting against principalities, against darkness, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so, man, the, the battle is out there. So what do we do? Consider Christ. Every day we've got to look at Jesus and say, Lord, you didn't cave in. You didn't give up. You kept going. You, you, your whole business is righteousness. It's not lostness. It's not going back. Okay. Our next scripture is going to be in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 14. If we consider Jesus, look where that puts us. I press toward the mark for the prize. Of what kind of call? High calling. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Woo! If you ever want a position, this is the place to get it. The high call of God. You can't get no better than that. That the Lord would ask us and touch us and forgive us. That's a high call. To come out of sin into the righteousness of Christ. Remember what David said? He said, uh, he's picked me up out of a horrible pit. <laughs> and he set my feet on a rock. Woo! That's shouting ground. Somebody may need to run. Wow. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7, here Paul is still helping us get a look in the writer of this lesson to get a look at the way we should finish our course. I fought what kind of fight? Good fight. I fought a good fight. And I have... I finished my course and I've kept the faith. What does Jesus do? He's run the race. He run a good race. Yeah, he finished his race. And the faith, he set the faith up for us to have victory in our own walk. 1 Peter 1 and 13. As we consider Jesus, we got to tighten our belts up. <laughs> gird, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope. Look what's going to happen if you soberly face eternity and say, it doesn't matter what happens down here. This world is not my home. I'm headed somewhere that's going to last forever. This body's doomed to the grave anyhow. So what are we going to do? Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace 
that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I was so proud of Brother Foster. His mother passed away a few days ago. He preached his mother's funeral today there at Midland. Was, Connie and I was there and another a group, group of people. And um, of course in any funeral service there's people there that's not right with God. And what he was so proud of his mom about was that, that his mom and dad left him a heritage. They raised him to go to heaven. And he said, I, I'm so proud that I had the opportunity. Why didn't, why didn't a drunk raise me or, or a harlot on the street or whatever? But he said, I never knew that kind of stuff in my parents. My parents carried us to church, taught us the scripture. And his mother was a Sunday school teacher for the young kids for years and years and years. Just loved, loved to pour into their hearts. And so he, he was talking about a godly heritage and he, and he encouraged the family. If, if you don't know, if you don't know Christ, if if it's going to take more than being a child of Abraham to get to heaven. That's what Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees. You must be what? Born again. And then with that born again, there must be a life that proves the walk. The walk's got to match the talk. And so here he is. <clears throat> Wherefore, gird up the Lord's your mind. Be sober. Hope how long? To the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ is going to be revealed to us pretty quick. We're going to see him coming in the glory. And isn't it going to be wonderful to say we cast off all the stuff except we're looking for Jesus. Woo! One more scripture and we're closing right here. This is 1 Peter 2 and 19. 1 Peter chapter 2 and, first, and verse number 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering <laughs> wrongly. <laughs> now, if you're out there raising Cain, they throw you in the clink. <laughs> You got what you deserved. <laughs> yeah. But if you're living for God and they put you in there or cuss you or hate you or whatever, then what you've done is you brought honor to the name of Christ. And that's, that's what we want to do. That's our business. Would you stand with me? Maybe you have some requests this evening.